Good morning. Welcome to Tusculum. Um, I am going to be substituting for our lovely Mac today. Um, she is currently at Crystal Springs. Um, our Synodic Camp is happening this week, so just keep all of them in your prayers. Um, just a few announcements. Um, next week, June 11th, um, we will be having a, a potluck. It's actually going to be a cookout. So we will have burgers, hot dogs, uh, sides. Those will be provided. Um, if anybody wants to bring desserts, please do that. Come eat with us. Invite everybody to come eat with us as well. Should be fun right after service. Um, and then also, um, Emery, her installation um, as pastor of Tusculum is going to be next uh, Sunday as well at 2 p.m. So if y'all could just come and say yay for that. We're going to make it official, finally. Um, and then also the food drive for Hillcrest United Methodist uh, for June. We'll be doing um, canned fruits, packaged fruits, um, anything like that that's shelf-stable. Um, and then also they'll, we're going to be starting a Bible and bingo. Is that right? Here we go, right there. Um, so it'll be the first and third Thursday starting July the 6th. Anybody who wants to, um, who's not working on Thursdays or just wants to show up, um, is welcome to come, study, and have fun. So is there any other announcements? Okay, perfect. Um, so just pray with me. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. Thank you for warmth and for sunshine. As we worship and go about our day, I pray that we keep you in our hearts and our minds. We ask for your love, guidance, and protection in everything we do. Please watch over those who are unable to join us and be with Emery as she brings us your words. In your name, amen. <laughs> this is why I keep my own copy of the order of worship. Um, please rise as you are able for the call to worship. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Glory to you forever. Speaker, Word, and Breath of Life, Glory to you forever. Font of Blessing, Living Water, Flowing River, Glory to you forever. Compassionate Mother, Beloved Child, Life-Giving Womb, Glory to you forever. Sun, Light, and Burning Ray, Glory to you forever. Gifted, Giver, Gift, and Giving, Loved, beloved, and love itself. Glory to you forever. Rock, cornerstone, and temple. Glory to you forever. Consuming fire, divine sword, overpowering storm. Glory to you forever. Rainbow of promise, ark of salvation, dove of peace. Glory to you forever. God who was, God who is, God who is to come. Only a God like you, only a God like you, only a God like you. Only a God like you, only a God like you, only a God like you. Only a God like you, only a God like you, only a God like you.
that you ran me ragged. I'm not even supposed to be running yet. And we played some <laughs> hardcore soccer after we got done with our lesson today. Oh, I'm sweaty. Are you sweaty? He hurt his knee. We were done. Hi, Andy. How are you? You good? Would you like to politely decline to answer? Yeah? Okay. Hi, Ava. Hello. <gasps> okay, so guys, today... It's really funny how this works out sometimes, but our BDZ lessons sometimes line right up with what we're going to talk about in worship today. Isn't that weird? It's not weird. I think it's a God sighting. That's right. That's right. It gets a, it's a little applause there, Andy. Good job. So what I want to focus on, though, because we did talk about taking care of one another today and how... As followers of Jesus, we want to take care of our community, right? We did. See, he was listening, girls. Um, but how does it feel to get taken care of? I talked about how when I was probably Gabe's age and I was sick, I had to stay in my bed, and my mom would bring a little bitty TV into my room with tomato soup and crackers, and I would watch like Wheel of Fortune and Reading Rainbow because I only got like channel five and eight on a TV that had these things. They're antenna. Do you even know what that is? No, probably not. Yeah. So that's what I had to watch. And I couldn't leave. I had to read and stay in bed. But that kind of it made me feel good when I was sick, right? So I have some objects. We're going to use our fingers so Ava can also participate. And I want us to see, how does this feel? Why don't you guys all kind of just feel that? How does that feel? What do you think? Soft. Soft, okay. You like that? What about this? What's that? Softer. That's even, yeah, that's even softer. What about, ooh, that just came apart. We'll have to fix that. What's that? Hardish. Hardish. That's not very comforting, is it? No, probably not. Ava might have fun with that thing. What about this? Ooh, it lights up. What about that? I'm like a cat sometimes. How does that feel? Wiggly. Let Andy feel that one and see if Ava feels that. What does that feel like, Andy? Squishy. Squishy. If it feels squishy. Let Ava feel that one. Now I've got something a little different. Feel that. What does that feel like? Harder. Yeah. Is it scratchy? Andy, do you want to feel that? No? Okay. Ava, do you want to feel this? This is a different feel. Does that feel? She's got all the things down there. She's just living life. That one feels scratchy, doesn't it? So which one of those do you think is more like being part of when we're loved by people? Doesn't it feel, does it feel like that sandpaper when we're loved well by other people? No, it doesn't feel like sandpaper. What does it feel like, probably? Which object do you think it feels more like when we're loved well by other people? Sandpaper. I know it's sandpaper. Which one do you think? I think maybe that one. It's nice. Like It's almost like a blanket, isn't it? And if it was a blanket, we could wrap ourselves up in it, and it's nice, and it's soft, isn't it? Because that's what it feels like to be loved. So sometimes we don't have a lot of stuff that we can give to one another, but there's something we always have enough of. Do you know what that is? Da? Yeah? Is that love? Yeah? We all have love. We all have God's love. Good job, Ava. You've got the answers, girl. There you go. Always listen to the children. We always have God's love. Wouldn't it be wonderful if that's how we made people feel? What do you think, Gabe? Would that be pretty cool? Yeah, it would be. All right, so that's what I want you guys to work on this week. We may not have anything we can physically give. We may not have money, but we do have our time. We have hugs. We have high fives. Can you give me a high five? Yes. We can have songs, and we make people smile. Ava, you're very good at that. You make people smile. Andy? Do you make people smile? Yes, you do. You make people smile. Absolutely. We can share God's love with one another, okay? So I want you to always remember, even if I don't have something to give, I 
always have something to give, okay? All right, I love you guys. I hope you have a wonderful week, okay? Can you help me put all these things back in the bag? Thank you. And you can go back, you can go upstairs or go back with your parents, your grandparents. Thank you so much. That would be great. I would love that, Andy. Let, let's talk. Let's talk about next week. Okay. Um, so now we're going to enter a time of the prayers of the people, and this is a time where we think about those um, in our lives who need the touch of um, God's healing and the Spirit. So let's pray. O blessed Trinity, in whom we know the maker of all things seen and unseen, the Savior of both near and far, Heal us from our sicknesses, our broken relationships, and our hurting hearts. By your spirit, enable us to worship your divine majesty in every facet of our lives, so that with all the company of heaven, we may magnify your glorious name, saying, Holy, 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 glory to you, O Lord Most High. Amen.
bow our heads for our prayer of dedication. Lord, what we have, we offer up to you, not only these tithes and offerings, but our lives, our energies, our hopes, and our love. We offer all of these things to you, Lord, who also gave to us all things. Amen. If you can, stand for the doxology. Good morning. It is so good to be in the house of God with you all this morning. Before we read our scripture, let's bow our heads with a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for today. Thank you for the heat. And thank you for um, the opportunity to be together and to hear from you and to hear from your word. I pray that you would teach us through your word this morning and that you would move in our hearts and our lives throughout this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture today comes from Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them to the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While the beggar held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? This is the word of God for the people of God. So, we have been in the church calendar for a while now. If you've noticed, we followed pretty closely. Um, And we finished Pentecost last week, which means that we're entering into the time in the church calendar called ordinary time, Um, which doesn't sound that exciting, but it is exciting. Um, Ordinary time is um, symbolized by the color green. If we can get to the slide... Thank you. So you can see that the ordinary time, there's Easter, which is white, and then Pentecost is bright red, like the Holy Spirit and the tongues of fire. And then um, ordinary time is green. And that symbolizes life, refreshment, growth. And so now we're in a time where we get to just dive in, and we're filled with the Holy Spirit, and we get to see what that new life looks like. And for that reason, I felt compelled to stay in the book of Acts, because the book of Acts follows the disciples on their journey after they've received the Holy Spirit, and what do they do now that Jesus has ascended and they have the Holy Spirit? What what do they do with that? And Acts is unique, because it's the only book in the New Testament that gives us 
the story of what the disciples did. Now, there are other books that talk about the disciples, but they're letters. They're like reading somebody else's mail, and there's a lot of other context behind what is happening. But in the book of Acts, we have a narrative, a story. How does this happen? Who are they, and what do the disciples do? Now, the book of Acts is actually a continuation of the book of Luke. It's written by the same author, and most scholars actually call it the book of Luke-Acts because it's just like part one and part two. Um, So a challenge that I encourage you to take, and one that I am undertaking this summer in my devotional time, is to read the book of Luke and the book of Acts as one story. Um, And when you do, you'll see patterns. This is something I just pulled off the internet, a pattern somebody saw in how the book of Luke and the book of Acts parallel each other. So there's a lot to to learn when we do that, when we read the whole story together. But the book of Acts, as I said, is unique because we get to see what the disciples did. We get to see the narrative after they received the Holy Spirit. What did they do with that? in this world. And so, in our story today, Peter and John are going up to the temple at the time of prayer, and they see a man crippled from birth who was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where every day he was put to beg from those going into the temple courts. Now, one of the things that struck me about this was that he's carried there every day. There's somebody in this man's life who every single day goes to get him from wherever he is and takes him to the steps on the temple and lets him stay there. So maybe they're friends. Maybe they're just really nice people. Um, Maybe they're family members. And one of the things that we don't remember is that in these days, there's not a lot of options for people who are differently abled. There's not a lot of options in the New Testament world for them. This man was crippled from birth, and so let's say it is his family taking him. They had no resources for him. There's no social security disability income to to receive. And so maybe this is the only option their family has, is to carry him to the temple so that he can beg and maybe support himself just a little bit and take some of that burden off of his family. So here he is at the temple, and Peter and John are about to enter, and Peter looks at him. Now the word looks is three times in the passage, but this time is different. The Greek word is different from the other occurrences in this passage and is most often and can be translated as looked intently or fixed his gaze, which means to look on with intention and intensity. I don't know if you've ever had this experience of somebody fixing their gaze on you. I'll tell you about one experience I had. When I was in seminary, I was taking a world religions class and I visited a mosque. And it was a great experience. Everybody was so hospitable and lovely. And there was one woman in particular who came up to me specifically, like none of my classmates, not my professor, just me. And she looked directly into my eyes. And I think that she like was looking into my soul. Like she like looked past everything else. And I was like, whoa. And she's just looking into my eyes. And, and then she handed me some books. I think it was like an English translation of the Quran. Um, I haven't read them yet. Maybe I will someday. Um, but I always will remember her face because she looked at me with this gaze, this fixed gaze. And that's what Peter's doing. He's looking at him, but he's really fixed his gaze on him. How often do we do that? Especially with strangers. Typically, I don't do that. I don't look at people with that kind of intensity, and especially not somebody who is begging. Often, I do the opposite. I feel a little uncomfortable, 
and I maybe try to see them as little as possible. Like I'm looking, like I know that they're there, but I'm not like looking at them. Because the last thing that I want to do is really see them and see their situation because that might be uncomfortable. I might feel like I have to do something about it, or I might feel helpless to do anything about it. So Peter fixes his gaze on this man. And I love that this comes from Peter. Peter in the book of Acts is fascinating to me because you remember when we looked through the book of John, how Peter was often so insecure that he was acting so brashly and then he'd have to pull himself back or Jesus would be like, whoa, Peter. And he seemed to be really uncertain of his identity, like he had to overprove himself. And in the book of Acts, Peter is so different. He seems grounded. He knows who he is. And he, he walks and moves with this authority and groundedness in Christ, like he knows exactly who he is. And so he stands there and he fixes his gaze on this man. And he sees him. He really sees him. And remember how much we talked about how often we only see what we think or expect or what we think is reasonable, but here he sees the man who others would have just perceived as crippled or just a beggar, just somebody you might glance at or maybe throw some coins to. And then he says, look at us seems kind of rude. Like, I don't go around telling people, look at me. Ooh. And the man had already seen him coming. It says in our scriptures that he saw them and he asked them for money. So he knew they were there. He saw them. So maybe this invitation, look at us, is not a command so much as it is an invitation to look back. Think about how this man is. He's on the stairs. And he's looking at Peter at his knees. Maybe if he's ashamed, he's even looking at his feet. And Peter says, look at us. Look into my eyes. Look back at me. It's an invitation. Throughout our Bible study, we have been talking about the word kinship. So for you guys in Bible study, this will be like be beating a dead horse. But for those of you who um, have not been, we read Greg Boyle's um, Tattoos on the Heart. Brittany led that Bible study and it was phenomenal. Um, and one of the central ideas about this book that we explored throughout the last few weeks is this idea of kinship. This idea of knowing somebody instead of just passing them by, instead of just judging them, or instead of thinking that you can fix them. It's about knowing and loving people and seeing them as people, and maybe that's exactly what Peter's doing. He's not saying, look at us, to be mean or demanding, but to acknowledge some kind of equality, to say, we see you, and you can see us too. Moreover, in the Western world, eye contact is very normal. We look into each other's eyes when we speak all of the time. When we're taught how to preach, we're told to make eye contact with people as we go. But in the Middle and Near East, eye contact is saved for intimate relationships. You don't look people in the eyes when you talk to them. That's, it's too intimate. It would be rude to do that. And so the fixed and the returned gaze, it's like an invitation to know him, to know one another, an invitation to equality and brotherhood. And so here Peter says, this is like the most powerful thing. If I could ever speak this eloquently, he says, silver or gold, I do not have but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. This is such a powerful statement. 
there's a couple of things that I want to take away from it. One of the things is that I think that we can sometimes forget that the disciples were not wealthy or even middle class at this point. They had left their blue collar jobs and they weren't getting any money from doing this thing that they were doing of following Jesus. In the book of Acts, they actually had to just pool all their resources so that they could survive. So they didn't really have any money. And I think that sometimes we think that when they say silver or gold, I do not have, they're just saying like, oh, I don't carry cash. Like, I'll just Venmo you later. Like, can I write you a check? Like, no, they're saying, I don't, we don't have anything. We don't have money to give you. Sometimes we equate money with power, importance, voice, legacy, purpose, and vision. Our culture certainly does make TV shows about people who are wealthy just to see how they live. We put people who are wealthy in power because we assume that wealth means that they must be important and have vision. We do this terrible thing where we think that just because someone makes less money or has less money that they have less purpose, voice, vision, power, or importance. But then we're reminded that more often than not, the heroes of our Bible stories are the working class folks. They're the fishermen who have left fishing to do what God told them, and there's no 401k involved. Meanwhile, the super wealthy are very often the villains in our stories, the ones stealing other people's lands like King Ahab, stealing other people's wives like King David, who to his credit did repent, or killing other people's children like King Herod and Pharaoh. However, Jesus entrusted his legacy not to people who have resources, but people who didn't. And he trusted that they would carry on the power of his voice and his vision in incredible ways. So one of the things that we need to do as we read this story is to relearn to expect vision and importance and purpose from every socioeconomic class. We're not just looking to the wealthy, but to each person who has Jesus. The second thing is this. Peter gives Christ like a gift. One commentator that I read pointed out that metal, like silver or gold, would save, but that Peter had something that would not keep. He said, Christ will spoil if kept to ourselves. If we try to keep love, it will become bitterness, loathing, and lust. If you try to keep beauty, eventually you'll become a mummy. And if you try to keep Christ, then eventually you'll become a bigot. Peter needed to give the gift of Christ away. It's like this, the story of the feeding the 5,000. The more that we give away, it's the more that we have. And if we try to hoard it, it simply spoils. So Peter saw that it was time to give the gift of Christ. He didn't have money, but he had something he knew was so much more valuable. Now, Peter saw what the man needed, and he offered it. Typically, if we're following our best practices as neighbor-loving Christians, we will ask people what they need, not assume. We shouldn't go around correcting people and saying, that's not what you need, I'll tell you what you need. We should listen to people and take their expertise on their own lives seriously. However, in the short interaction here, Peter did assume, rightly, that the root of the issue was not that the man needed money, but that he needed to be able to walk in a world that would never see him or treat him as equal because of his disability. Now, not all people with disabilities need healing. My second year in Mexico, 
one of the volunteer college students I was responsible for had cerebral palsy. And he was functionally able to do anything anybody else was. But his leg was twisted, and he walked with a slight limp. Otherwise, he was very strong and active and really funny, and we loved having him on the team. Well, we went to a church in Mexico that was doing faith healings. It was a charismatic church. And as we talked about last week, we have a lot to learn from people in Pentecostal and charismatic churches, and I'm grateful for them. However, what this man do- did was that he insisted that my student, we'll call him John, come up for healing. And I could kind of tell John didn't want to, so I told him, you don't need to do that. But he felt really pressured because the man was calling on him specifically. And so the man prayed for him and told him that he was healed and told him to start running around the sanctuary. So he did. And everybody started cheering because he was running. But what they didn't see is that when he stopped... He was, of course, just back to normal. And really, he was not healed. It's just that the limp was less noticeable when he runs, but he was always able to run. The man had made it appear that he was healed by making him run around the sanctuary, and everybody else fell for the illusion. When we got back to the place where we were staying to debrief, John explained that he's always open to God healing him, but that he's not interested in being used for someone to showboat. He felt humiliated and used by the experience because he knew that he didn't need to be healed from cerebral palsy to be whole. He was already equipped by God to love and serve the world in exactly the way he was supposed to with his body as it was. The bigger problem for the man in this story is not that he's crippled, though that is, of course, a source of incredible suffering. The bigger problem is that he's in a society that cannot allow him to operate as the person God made him to be because he was crippled. All he could do was be brought to the temple and beg. That's all the world would allow him to contribute. But now, with his healing, he is freed into a whole myriad of possibilities. And so, I think that was point three. (laughs) Sorry. So, his healing meant that he was restored to the community. The fourth point is this. His Freedom starts with the physical rather than the spiritual. In Western thinking, our bodies are separate from our spirits, which are separate from our minds. But we are made in the image of God, and so these three things are one. We are one person with three parts that are all equally ourselves. We are bodies, we are minds, we are spirits. And these things are essentially connected. We forget that, and we forget that God's not just interested in healing one portion of a person. God started with the physical constraints, knowing that they were essentially connected to every other part of this person. Healing can look a lot of different ways. My mom is an oncologist, a cancer doctor, and I have always known that she has a ministry. Because there is a ministry in caring for people in their bodies. People here who are nurses and health professionals know that it is so important to care for people's bodies. And that in doing so, you are ministering to their whole person. The church itself used to be a hospital. Many nuns and monks would spend their time healing people by taking care of them. And so that time that you spend bathing somebody or exercising their limbs or making sure they are well-fed is all ministry. We tend to think that we either heal people by miracles or by science, and that one is with God and one is without. But the amazing thing about God is that God can heal however God wants to heal. And sometimes that looks like the passage this morning. A crippled man leaping and jumping in an instant. 
And sometimes healing can look like surgeries, medications, and thoughtful medical care that can help a person recover or live for many more meaningful moments. My last point for this morning is this. Who gets the credit for this healing? It's not a trick question. It's God. The man gets up and starts praising God. He doesn't start praising Peter and John. He praises God. Because even when we get to be involved in God's healing work, it's important that we not put the burden or the praise for healing on ourselves. It's the great paradox of faith. We know that if we do nothing, nothing will get done. But we know that what does happen, happens because of God. As soon as we start to take, to take credit for healing, we turn ourselves into God, and the world will expect more from us than it is humanly possible. And as soon as we take the burden for healing, we'll put more on, on, on our shoulders than any person can bear. We are not put on this earth to heal every person, but to follow God and to make God's will done. And if we follow and take risks and really try to follow this God, then we'll see the amazing things God can do and know that it was God's spirit empowering us, God's creation, to pour out God's love on God's hurting world. So our challenge for us this week is this, to ask ourselves, how are we called to participate in God's healing work in the world? whether you have a lot of money, resources, connections, or time, or whether you have very little of those things. You have Christ. You have Christ's love, so you have the best gift that there is to give. Seek opportunities this week to fix your gaze on someone and to show them Christ's love. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this word. Thank you for your healing love that you have given to each of us. Thank you for fixing your gaze on us. Help us this week to see how we may love others and to perceive how we might participate in your healing work in the world. Amen. And now, as we celebrate communion together, we remember that Christ's love is such that has no bounds. Christ did not say, stay in safety, but came to the world in love, healing, and hope. And although the world responded with hatred and fear, Christ did not t turn aside or run. Christ fixed his gaze on us and did not turn aside even when the cross was before him. And in his love, Christ suffered the wrath of the sinful world raging against a loving God. And he bore that sin in his own body. But God's love proved stronger than our hatred, so Christ was raised from the dead, so that in him we may have new life. And we now, empowered by the Spirit, embody Christ's life, love, healing, and hope in our bodies, in our church, in our homes, and in our communities. And that's why we join together at this table to remember the fixed gaze of love that recreated us into people free from the hatred and sin of the world and into a community free to share together in a, mealing, in a meal of healing and love. And so, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this, is the cup, uh, in, this cup is the covenant uh, in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you take this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for coming to this world, for living in the messy reality that is our human life, and for living a life completely and perfectly shaped by God's love and mercy, so that when you were unjustly killed, and the world had done its worst, and the darkness fell, and we wondered whether we would ever emerge from the evil we had made, you, God, did not regard it as an end but a beginning. Thank you for fixing your loving gaze on us. 
Thank you for your healing, for the cross, for the new life of the resurrection, and for the hope we have in you for the whole world. Amen. And so if I can have the elders come forward. We need one more. Anybody who has been an elder, thank you. Christ. In a moment, I will invite you to come up to get the elements. The bread is all gluten-free, and it is non-alcoholic grape juice. You may come up to receive the elements from the elder in front of your section. If you cannot come up to receive the elements, you may raise your hand, and someone will bring them to you. Do not eat or drink until all have been served, and then we will take the elements together. Come now to the Lord's table. For you, Christ's blood 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 for you.
This is Christ's body, broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of what Christ has done for you. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink in remembrance of the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your life, your death, and your resurrection. Thank you, Lord, for this community of people who have come together in love and support for your ministry, which we pray will manifest through our lives. We are grateful, Lord, that you have put us in each other's lives to be your body and to do your healing work in the world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you are in need of prayer, um, I invite you to come forward during the song of discipleship, and I'd be happy to pray for you. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. now the benediction. Go in love, go in joy, go in peace, and go give your all to God who has given all to us. Amen. <laughs>